Good afternoon. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining us for another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're highly privileged today to be joined by one of the most interesting new figures in American politics, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Um, the mayor is from South Bend, Indiana, grew up there. His folks uh, taught at Notre Dame. He went to Harvard as an undergrad. Then he went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, returned back to the US, worked at McKinsey Consulting Firm. Uh, then he moved back to South Bend, ran for uh, mayor, served for two terms. And during his time as mayor, he was actually deployed to Afghanistan uh, via the uh, Naval Reserve. Um, the mayor, of course, ran for the presidency in 2020. We'll talk a lot about that campaign. He's also the author of a terrific memoir called Shortest Way Home that came out last year. It's really a terrific book. And then he has a new book that'll be coming out in about 10 days called Trust, America's Best Chance. He's now teaching at the University of Notre Dame. Has actually just launched a podcast called The Deciding Decade. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's a treat to be with you. Great. Well, I, in your book, is, it's so delightful on many levels, but the one thing that first drew me in was your, your description of your race uh, for treasure in 2010, and particularly because it seemed to capture some of the rituals of American politics and uh, in a really kind of interesting and vivid way. And you began that chapter by saying, no one sits on his mother's knee and says he hopes one day to become state treasurer. Uh, the truth is that I made it through my schooling and early adulthood without ever noticing the office existed or giving it any thought what it meant. And yet it's interesting, when you ran, you actually were animated by a very specific issue that really brought you in. So tell us about the race and particularly what kind of enduring impact it had on your career. Yeah, and I'll do my best not to draw you into all of the blow by blow of Indiana politics right around then. But, but what, what was going on was uh, the Great Recession was upon us. The, uh, auto industry was collapsing, which meant uh, countless jobs in our home state of Indiana. And what really uh, drew me into this race was I saw what happens when somebody in an important position, frankly, a position that ought to be a little bit bureaucratic and boring, is so consumed by ideology that they forget what it means. So to make a very long story short, the incumbent was going all the way to the Supreme Court uh, using his position as state treasurer to try to prevent the entire Obama administration action to rescue the auto industry, which would have destroyed so many livelihoods in our state. And I asked around, you know, who's running against this guy? And the answer was kind of, well, you know, uh, nobody. Uh, for the, in, in hindsight, very understandable reason that a down ticket uh, statewide campaign, especially for a Democrat, especially in Indiana, and especially in the midterms of President Obama's first term was gonna be a pretty tough sled. Um, but I thought, you know, this is really important. And, and so I, I stepped up to run and, and I'm so glad I did. I learned campaigning, I learned fundraising, I learned how to interrupt strangers who were enjoying a chicken sandwich at a county fair somewhere and hand them a, a, a pamphlet and tell them why you're running for office. And uh, even though I, I didn't come close to winning that first time out. Um, I just learned a lot about uh, how, how campaigning works and it, it helped, I think, cement my awareness of how you can make a difference and sometimes how you can make a difference, uh, you know, before the first vote is even cast, just through the kind of campaign and, and, and people and, and movement that you put together. Well, you describe campaigning in your book, you say campaigning is enormously difficult, but it's not complicated. Yeah. Elaborate on that. Well, if you think about it, uh, at, at the fundamental level, a campaign has one goal, and that's to make sure more people vote for you than the other person. And everything's about that. You're just trying to convince people of that. And all the sophistication of polling and campaigning and, and uh, fundraising and uh, social media now, all, all of that all comes down to this incredibly simple single number. <laughs> there's, there's two numbers, and if your number is higher, uh, then you win. And so there's a, there's a kind of simplifying power to that, if you can hold it in mind. And what I learned is that you know, certain things you just go out and do. Uh, you, you, need, you need money, so you ask people to help. You need votes, so you ask people to support you. You need uh, people to come to your side, so you uh, ask them to consider the values that, that you're standing for and the, the difference it would make if, if, if you won instead of the other person. And if, if you start from that very almost simplistic place, I think it helps you cut through a lot of the drama and the sizzle that, that 
uh, kind of consumes how we see politics as citizens and viewers watching, especially the national show, play out on, on cable TV. Well, you, you, in the book, you've described yourself several times as, a, as an introvert. And I wonder, what are the special challenges of an introvert in politics? I mean, obviously, when you walk into a room, you got to gather yourself and, you know, start making yeah. the rounds. I mean, to, to talk about the challenges of being an introvert in this profession. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, there, there's often a misunderstanding about uh, uh, introverts, which is it's, it's not about, you know, not liking people, but it's about where you get your energy. And uh, I found that, you know, I gather a lot of energy when I'm alone, when I'm reading, or if I'm with, you know, one uh, or two close friends, or if I'm, if I'm with my, uh, my husband, Chastin. Uh, and then I go out and I sort of use that energy. Uh, I, I kind of make a withdrawal when I'm out among people. And uh, it's different from, from how a lot of uh, politicians are, who, who I think feed off the energy uh, that they get from being around people. And so you just, you, you learn to kind of manage that uh, and, and you, you, you think about it. Um, and, and then some of it's just literally learning to go out and stick your hand out and uh, uh, interrupt a stranger who seems to just be going about their business because that's, that's part of how campaigning works. Uh, and, and by the end, you know, things I never thought I'd take to, like, uh, you know, being in a parade, uh, uh, wound up being something I really took a lot of pleasure in, uh, connecting with people, even if it's just for a fraction of a second, uh, uh, shaking, shaking hands, um, to back when we were shaking hands, um, to, to try to form a connection that you can then stitch to the deeper motivations you have for running or the policies you care about or the, the issues you want to do something on. I want to read one thing you wrote that, I, that I was delightful. You said, retail, retail politics is never fun among the intoxicated. If a voter who doesn't like you has a lot to drink, you get an earful. It's even worse if a voter who does like you has been drinking. The handshakes last way too long, and they keep repeating themselves. That's yep. one of the rituals you just have to kind of fight through, huh? <laughs> Yeah, for retail politics, there's nothing worse than campaigning when people have been drinking. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so we have this tradition in South Bend called Dingus Day, which is great fun. It's, it's common to a few uh, places in the country that have large Eastern European uh, uh, communities. There's polka, there's, you know, sausage and, uh, and, and, and cabbage and beer, and, and uh, it's great fun. And it's also, by tradition, become a, a very important kind of political moment in retail campaigning. In our city, all the way back to uh, Bobby Kennedy had to uh, make sure he was in South Bend on, on, on uh, this holiday of Dingus Day, which is Easter Monday. Um, but what I learned over time is you got to be kind of strategic about this. Uh, there are certain places you want to be campaigning earlier in the day rather than later. Uh, by mid-afternoon, you really want to be sticking to the church halls and uh, away from some of the other venues. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just uh, uh, it's not going to be as rewarding. Well, I had an interesting experience. I, I taught a class on Congress this last year, and one of the exercises, I asked the students to map a 10-year political plan culminating in them running for Congress in a decade, and a strikingly large number of them began their essay by saying that they would move to a different community that they thought was more congenial to their, you know, political values, etc., and I thought of that in the context of you, because you're obviously, you know, in a blue city, but in a very red state, and I wonder how being in a red state has affected your political career. I mean, it's, has it just in some sense made running for governor or senator less congenial and it just kind of focused you more nationally or reflect on that? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people uh, have a decision somewhere early in their lives or careers about whether to go home or whether to go somewhere else. And going home was one of the best uh, decisions I made, although it wasn't uh, an obvious one. Uh, in fact, at the time I was in business, I spent most of my time in larger cities. And I remember uh, t mentioning to somebody that I was moving home to, to South Bend and, and they asked if I had a relative who was unwell uh, because they just couldn't fathom why I'd want to go home. And that actually made me that much more militant about being committed to, to my community. Uh, the truth is, I don't think you can really game out the politics of it. Uh, uh, too much uh, because things are, are always changing. I mean, the, the, there's just no uh, such thing as a permanently red or, or blue state. Uh, and things shift so quickly. I mean, to take one example, that, that treasury race I was running, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was a deadly issue for Democrats. We were getting killed on it. Even, even people like me running for offices that had nothing to do with it. And eight years later, it was a winning issue, even in Indiana, uh, for a lot of Democratic candidates. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't think most people would have guessed that uh, uh, 
Indiana would vote Democratic for the first time in 50 years in 2008, and that the candidate of all candidates to do it was not John Kerry or Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton, it was Barack Obama. Uh, and, and so I think we sometimes uh, overestimate our ability to kind of game out the moves. And, and I think it's, it's best to focus less on the, 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 the job you hope to have and more on the impact you hope to make and let that lead you through maybe some unexpected opportunities. And as I wrote about it, I never would have guessed I would have run for treasurer. And certainly when I was running for mayor of South Bend for a lot of reasons having to do with my city, uh, in no version of my wildest uh, predictions would I have guessed that, that in my eighth year, I'd be putting together a presidential campaign. Uh, and so it, there's, there's not much to be gained, I think, by overthinking this. Uh, when you can fit your, you can organize your steps more around the things you want to work on, the things you care about, which will propel you to do well, whatever it is you're doing, then figuring out what slot's going to be open when and how you're going to work your way into it. Well, let's talk about your time as mayor of, of South Bend, because it seemed as you write about it that you're balancing kind of two competing kind of tendencies. One, you say that you tend to be very analytical and oriented towards data. But also you picked up very sim very early on the importance of symbol and intuition. And you tell a great story in the book where I guess, I think I forget what the issue was, but you were talking to a city councilman who thought that maybe you were moving too much in the data realm. And he said, Pete, you're reminding me of Bob McNamara, Circa <laughs> Vietnam. Pick up on how you, how you bring together those elements of both being really analytical, but also employing intuition, common sense, compassion. Yeah, you know, I was a very data-oriented guy when I arrived, and still am in some ways. But what I found more and more was that so much of the power of the office was really in these unofficial symbolic things. I used to hate that stuff, ribbon cuttings, parades. I, I want to leave that to somebody else so that I can do policy all day. And over time, what I found is that sometimes that is policy, uh, where you show up, who you stand next to. The, these things really matter, uh, if only to tell a certain uh, part of the community or organization or group that they matter uh, by deploying that symbolic power that's been placed in your hands uh, to legitimize them. And I think about this a lot right now looking at, at our president because the presidency maybe is the job that, that most reflects this. Yes, it has very specific and enormous formal powers, but it's actually the informal powers to set the tone, to uphold norms or change them. Um, you could argue that's where the greatest impact of the most consequential presidencies has been. And I think you, you learn that uh, uh, from the very beginning as a mayor, where you, you, you discover uh, that so much of your ability, even in what we call a strong mayor system, which I should mention also, of course, different states have very different models. Um, and we were in what you would call a strong mayor system, where the mayor really was the day-to-day the -day executive of the city. Uh, but even there, uh, a lot of times where you were really earning your paycheck, especially when the community was hurting, uh, was uh, attending to, to functions that, that weren't uh, all about the, uh, uh, the things you can kind of run down on paper. Well, a few weeks ago, I actually had a wonderful conversation with Mary Robinson, the former president of mm -hmm. Ireland, who was saying she had been in politics for 20 years in the Irish Senate, but it wasn't until she became president that she appreciated the power of symbol. And she talked about handing up a wel or putting up a, a welcoming lantern in her presidential residence to signal that, you know, everyone was welcome in Ireland. And she said that it was really striking that once she, 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 as she grew to understand the importance of symbol, it really enhanced her ability to communicate with the people of Ireland. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes a, a gesture carries great weight or great power. And I think we have a bias toward assuming things matter in proportion to how elaborate they were. Sometimes I'd work on some policy for 18 months trying to get it right and discover that I, I kind of got more credit for, uh, you know, something I did in the space of a day. Um, and you know, rightly or wrongly, the, the, the truth is that you, you can never quite gauge which things are going to matter most uh, or, or which things people are going to be most aware of. In your book, you quote Leonard Bernstein to say, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. Um, play off of two things that you talked about in the book. One, the concert performance you delivered uh, at the South Bend Symphony, um, Rhapsody in Blue, and then also that the housing initiative that, that followed that. Talk about those two things in the context of both a plan and also a pretty urgent deadline. 
Yeah, so our, our housing initiative really was about dealing with vacant and abandoned houses. It's an example of how different things are in different communities. In a lot of places in the U.S. where we can't get enough housing built quickly enough. But in my city, we'd lost about 30,000 people over the years. And uh, especially when I was talking to low-income residents, largely in, in mostly black and brown neighborhoods, what I, what I heard constantly uh, was that they were suffering damage to their property value because of an empty house next to them that it's sat there maybe for five or 10 or, or, or even 15 years. And they viewed the fact that that house was allowed to sit there as evidence that the city didn't care about them. Uh, and uh, even though often the city didn't even own it or control it, uh, that was still, of course, the message that was sent by the fact that it was there. And so we wanted to do something about it and, and quickly. And uh, what we did was uh, act to uh, address a thousand properties in a thousand days. And, uh, oh, did you lose me? We're fine, we're fine. Okay, good. Um, so uh, we knew that there was a lot of power in a deadline. Uh, we, what we knew was that if, if, we, if we could address a thousand of the properties in the worst shape, save them if we could, tear them down if we had to, uh, just to improve or, or, or stabilize those neighborhoods, uh, then we would have a, a, a chance to really reshape how the city thought about itself and unlock new opportunities. Um, so we knew the number was about there. We didn't know if it was possible. And I thought that what we really needed was to stretch ourselves with a goal that was tough to meet because that would compel us. And, and the other important thing was to publicize the goal. So at the beginning of that thousand days, I said, we're going to do this. And of course, what that meant was you're very vulnerable <laughs> because everybody could tell if you fail to meet your goal. So by making it public and committing to it, you committed yourself and the whole administration to getting it done. And, and that was where it reminded me of a, of a performance. So I, I had uh, agreed to perform with our symphony orchestra as a way to show support for the arts. And, uh, you know, so much of the excitement and the tension in, in the performance hall, uh, as I was, you know, arguably overshooting my, my uh, uh, talent as, as a pianist, was, uh, you know, can he do it or not? We sold out the house and got a lot of uh, ticket sales for the local symphony. Uh, and and it went, the performance went well, but um, but it was really that 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 moment where you step onto the stage and nobody knows if you're going to pull it off or not. That creates a kind of energy uh, that, in the case of the city as a whole, I think allowed people to root for the city in a new way. Well, in your book, you talk about the relationship between South Bend and Notre Dame, of course, a very intimate relationship. And you, you make an interesting point about a, a kind of an old model, which you called College Town 1.0 being supplanted by what you think is a better model, which you call College Town 2.0. Tell us about what that model looks like. Yeah, so what I was describing as 1.0 are, are communities that have colleges in them. Uh, but uh, if you look at the way they interact, the college might as well be any other large employer. It'd be the same as if it were a hospital or a, uh, or a corporate headquarters of some kind. Uh, but I think there's something really unique and distinctive about the role of colleges and universities right now. And a, a community that's effective at harnessing that actually takes advantage of the fact that it's not just any other big employer uh, because of what people are working on every day. And I'm seeing this in a whole new way now that I'm on the faculty uh, side at Notre Dame. Uh, and what we, uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, if, if there is a student, let's say a civil engineering student, uh, who's, you know, one of the most talented uh, emerging uh, in her generation, it's great if she decides to, you know, clean up trash on the riverside or be part of some uh, volunteer initiative in town. But if I can get her to be part of a volunteer initiative that involves engineering, then it's a huge win-win for the community and for her. And I think now as we contemplate the role of universities in the 21st century, the more we can tether the substance of the work that the students and faculty are doing, not just treating them as warm bodies or economic actors, but really thinking about what they do all day, advancing knowledge, and link it to the day-to-day -day, uh, concerns and, and struggles and often you know, there's a, there's a powerful uh, uh, kind of social dimension to this too. And our community is a good example. People don't always realize this if they've never visited South Bend. We're a very low income community. When I took office, our per capita income was, I think, shy of uh, $19,000 per person. We're a very racially diverse community. Uh, and students, uh, you could tell, stood to, to, to uh, learn as much from traveling a mile or two into our town. Uh, as they uh, would uh, really, you know, going on a study abroad program sometimes. And, and of course, we did everything we could to encourage that. 
Well, let's talk, uh, Mr. Mayor, about your presidential campaign. And uh, of course, everyone followed it. You did, uh, you know, one Iowa, finished second in New Hampshire, captured really the attention of the country and the world. What most surprised you about the campaign? I mean, you've obviously been thinking about it for a while, but as you look back on it now, what was most surprising? Well, you spend a lot of time talking to people about, uh, or hearing from people, I should say, about the most important thing in their lives. When somebody comes up to a presidential candidate to shake hands after a speech, if they have something to say, it's about the thing in their life most impacted by politics and politicians. And you would see how that was different in some ways in the different places we traveled, but also how it was the same in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and you start seeing patterns. Sometimes what the reporters were asking about after a speech was totally different than what the uh, voters were asking about during the town hall. Uh, take a simple example of mental health, something I heard way more about from voters than I really ever did in, in the commentary or the coverage. And so you begin learning kind of what's on people's minds in a new way. And, and you come to learn that, you know, on one hand, there's, there's tremendous variety and diversity in, in, in our country. And on the other hand, so much of what people are dealing with is pretty similar. Uh, people are trying to make sure that they can earn enough to get by and take care of their family. They expect to be better off in their parents' generation. They want health care. Uh, you know, we want, we want to know the planet's going to be in good shape uh, for a future generation. We're, there's some fundamentals here that, uh, again, get kind of dazzled out of our view when we're following, especially with, with the level of distraction and diversion that I think has been created by this White House. Um, but, uh, you know, what most people are worried about, uh, the, the issues that, that really should command our attention right now, from economic and racial justice uh, to issues around health care and, 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 uh, and our climate future, uh, the, these are the, the things that, that we always need to bring it back to in a way that is just hard sometimes for national politics to stay with. One thing that I think probably most of us uh, had a chance to see were the debates, and there was a lot of them. They were large. They were fairly raucous. Um, what was it like to be kind of at the epicenter of that? I mean, when your polling numbers are up, it seems like everyone's coming after you. As you, as you reflect on these debates, were they ultimately a healthy uh, exercise, or did they just become a bit of a uh, distraction? Well, you know, I'd grown up watching debates as two candidates, usually two candidates for president, uh, who uh, were competing over their vision. Uh, then you go in and, and find a, you know, a 10-person scrum uh, where it's as much a competition for attention as it is a chance to share a vision. And I, I did uh, struggle with that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what I'd hoped a debate would be versus what the debates sometimes became. But I'll say this, I actually think in the end, uh, for all the uh, uh, real challenges and frustrations through that process across the, the nine presidential debates I wound up uh, uh, being part of, they really did get a chance to see the differences in substance and style. Uh, and, and just as importantly, I think if you look back on them as a whole, you could see uh, the similarities among, uh, uh, you know, 20 plus Democratic candidates in the broad strokes of what we believe, uh, which I think helps to explain why in a moment like this, uh, our big tent, which is famously fractious, is also remarkably united in, in uh, coming together to try to win this election. I'm, I'm interested in, in how campaigns end. And I'm thinking my, my wife's an actor, and she says in every play that she's in, when it ends, there's, there's kind of a period of mourning. You've had this intense experience with people. Uh, in some ways, you've gotten to know them over a short period of time better than the, your, your own family. You've been thrown together and then, then it ends and you go in different directions. How was it for you when the campaign ended? Was there a period of just sort of, you know, what is my next project? What do I do? How do I stay in touch with these people? Well, what made it strange for, for me was that at the moment the campaign ended, within about a week or two of that was also when the lockdowns began. So uh, not only were you learning how to go from 100 miles an hour to, uh, to sitting still, but you were literally sitting still, confined to quarters, and uh, wound up, I think I'll never be able to separate uh, the, the effects of, of, of one from the other. It may have done me some good, because probably what, what Chasten and I most needed was to be at home, to spend more time with each other than we've been able to in a year and a half, uh, and, and to just be in one place and, 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 and think clearly. But of course, the other thing about uh, ending a, a primary campaign is there's still an unbelievably important general election campaign going on. So in that sense, maybe it was less, uh, uh, less, less the feeling of uh, coming to the end of the performance and more 
uh, getting ready for a new act where uh, maybe you're not uh, the, the, the lead character, you're learning how to be in the supporting cast. And it's just as important to do a good job there uh, than, than it was when uh, the campaign you were worried about was your own. But let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. I mean, you're at Notre Dame, you're teaching, you've written a book, um, you have a, a, a podcast that was just launched a couple of weeks ago. Tell us how those uh, are contributing to, to the contribution you want to make going forward. Well, the, the forthcoming book and uh, in the course at Notre Dame as well, uh, center on the theme of trust. It's something I'm very concerned about. Matter of fact, I, I think we have a threefold crisis of trust in this country. Uh, trust in our institutions, including our government, trust in each other, and then the world's trust in the United States as a whole. And I think for us to uh, have the, the 2020s unfold in the way we're really going to need them to for the future of the country, uh, we need to do something about it. And that's been my focus, both with, with the research uh, that I'm doing as, as part of uh, uh, the university and, and with the book that I wrote up that I, I hope will contribute to how people are thinking about this. And I think these issues are only growing more urgent. You consider, for example, uh, the importance of people having trusted sources of information about what to do when a vaccine becomes available. Uh, you know, lives literally depend on our ability to uh, trust uh, uh, health authorities to trust uh, the government, uh, uh, that uh, we can look to each other and, and at least believe we're in the same reality, even if sometimes our values or our interests are competing. Uh, right now, there, there seems to be trouble even trusting that, that we're uh, in the same field of fact. And that's incredibly dangerous for our ability to solve problems for each other. Now, I also think there are solutions. Uh, I think that, I think back to my time in uniform and the way trust was built in a hurry, uh, uh, because we had to. Uh, during a deployment and trying to find ways uh, both at, at an immediate level, uh, including literally through, through maybe more opportunities for civilian service, but also just thinking about that as an example, uh, the ways that, that countries build trust and the way the U.S. could restore our credibility before it's too late. Um, because the, uh, I actually think American leadership is going to be needed more than ever around the world if we're going to contend with issues like climate, like uh, public health and pandemic response. Uh, but none of it works if countries don't trust us to begin with. I, I, I was interested in your comment about the military, because one, one point you make in your book, which was really stunning to me, was that it, I guess in the class of 1956, the majority of the graduates, I think, in Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton, join the military. I mean, it was considered a rite of passage for even elite culture. And that has completely shifted. Is, is that been dangerous to the country that we've had this disconnect between the military and the rest of the, the country? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at uh, periods in US history where, uh, you know, someone like a young John F. Kennedy for the first time finds himself taking orders from the son of a, perhaps a farmer in Indiana. And uh, that had a leveling effect because it was understood that everybody in America, no matter, uh, you, you know, even if you were privileged, in fact, especially if you were privileged, uh, had to do their part. And I just think that stands in such stark contrast to the way, frankly, the way our current president avoided serving, uh, uh, but also the way an entire generation of uh, well-off or privileged people avoided serving. I, I thought about that looking at my own, you know, I was never uh, wealthy uh, like the Kennedys, but, but I did have the benefit of a, an elite education and thought back to, you know, I, I could count on one hand the number of people I went to Harvard with who served, which, uh, which was one of the moments in my life I realized I, I might be part of the problem if I didn't go ahead and do my part. Well, Mr. Mayor, we have some questions for you. We've gotten really from across the country. Um, I, I can summarize about 50 questions <laughs> by saying this. If, if there is a Biden administration, would you be interested in serving in any position? We, we have a number of recommendations if you want to hear them, but that, that's been a persistent question. Uh, just before answering the question, and I promise I'm not uh, doing this to play for time, but I think we just have a quick tech uh, uh, thing. Are we switching cameras? Does that sound right? Yes, yeah. Just let me know when you see me on the new one and hopefully, uh, hopefully that crosses right over. Sorry about that. I think we're in good shape. Okay. Okay, you got me on the new one then? I guess we, we don't. We have in the same one. Okay. Not 
All right, thanks for bearing with me on that. So, uh, you know, you know the, the short answer to your question is, of course, I, 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 I draw a great meaning from public service, and I would love to be supportive in that way, but uh, we, we've got uh, a, a much more immediate issue right now, which is to make sure there is, in fact, a Biden administration. And uh, that's uh, not, you know, we're winning. <laughs> the, the, the team I'm on is, is winning, but um, this is gonna be a real challenge, uh, not only uh, continuing to make the case and, and, and win, but to uh, uh, really make sure the mechanics of the elections themselves go well, to head off efforts at voter suppression, and to make sure that false allegations of, uh, of voting issues aren't used as some kind of pretext to reduce the legitimacy of the elections themselves. That's, that's a real, I mean, the fact that the President of the United States uh, was asked yesterday if he was committed to a peaceful transition of power and had any answer other than yes, of course, is uh, uh, I think an item of deep concern, uh, partly an item of political strategy because it gets us talking about something other than the uh, failures in the response to the pandemic, but also something that we can and should be legitimately worried about. But, but some argue that he's in a certain sense trying to get in the Democrats' head, that um, his term expires on January 20th, 2021, and he's, he's not going to be president after that unless he's sworn in by the Chief Justice. So, I mean, do you think that is to some extent a political ploy to get Democrats dispirited, make Democrats think twice about even going to vote? Well, I think it's both. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's got value as a political diversion, um, but it's also something that uh, intrinsically matters. And when you have a president willing to, to play games like that, uh, it, it really uh, does put us as a country, I'm not just talking about Democrats, just as a country, in an extremely difficult position. Because the reality is no matter how well-crafted our laws and constitution, to some extent, they just rely on a certain level of restraint, a certain level of honor. Uh, especially among those who are most powerful. You know, if you look at the Federalist Papers, the founders agonized over how much trust you would dare place in one official, uh, the president. And, you know, had, had, had been able, that experiment in trust um, was basically vindicated up until now. Uh, but I don't think the founders accounted for uh, the kind of bad faith that we now have in, in the White House, and frankly, in a lot of those who, who protect uh, out of partisan loyalty, protect a, a president uh, doing things that have nothing to do with being conservative or, or liberal. They're, they're just harmful. We have a question from Bill from, from Washington, D.C., who says, um, given your background in presidential debates, how would you advise Joe Bayton to debate Donald Trump? I assume it would be difficult to engage the president uh, on the nuances of the nuclear triad. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start with a note of humility, which is that the idea of advising someone who won the nomination when I didn't. Uh, but what I will say is I'm, I'm really hoping to see uh, a picture of what our country could be. I think we, we all know what we're up against right now. We, we've seen the, the, the failed response to the pandemic. We've seen economic freefall. Uh, we've seen how divided this country has become under this president. So uh, in addition to uh, holding him to account for that, what I'm really looking forward to is a kind of show versus tell, because when, I, when I'm with uh, Joe Biden or even just when I see him on, on television, what I always see is somebody who gets up in the morning and his first thought is how to heal and unify, how to bring Americans together and get stuff done. And I think it's as much just modeling what uh, a president can be like, what a president ought to be like, putting us in touch with that better future that we could have. I think that's going to be just as important as uh, what Americans already, I think, largely know and believe. Uh, which is an awareness of the, the, just the harm that's going on in this country, the chaos that's going on in this country under the president that we have now. Well, Bill from Chicago asks, how diff difficult is it in this political environment to actually talk about the issues? I mean, was this, I mean, obviously when you were in, in the race, the environment was different and it was pre-COVID, but even then, was it hard to break through and, and to discuss the issues with all of the kind of the... Uh, polarization that's that's infecting the political debate? I think it can be. There, there's always this pull toward the drama. And again, this is part of how the president has, uh, has been able to really hack our system and even hack our uh, attention spans as, as, as voters and citizens. Um, but, uh, you know, I think good politics is about uh, everyday lives. Uh, when I'm watching this uh, uh, Supreme Court fight play out, for example, um, yes, I care about the procedural hypocrisy of the Republicans. In fact, it's maddening. But uh, 
at the end of the day, that takes a backseat to the level at which I care about uh, the health care that family members of mine stand to lose in a matter of weeks from right now, uh, depending on uh, a decision before the court about the Affordable Care Act. I think about uh, my marriage, the most important thing in my life that only exists by a margin of one vote on that high court. And uh, I think that uh, what we always need to do is bring it back to everyday life, uh, bring it back to how each of our lives goes different. Uh, you know, government can't make you thrive, but it can create the conditions where you thrive. And it can create conditions that stop you from thriving. That's what this is about. And the more we can keep into that, uh, and, and the less it's about the noise machine and the, just the, the we're kind of razzle-dazzle of, of, of where politics has got to, uh, then uh, I think the better served we're going to be and the better decisions we're going to make as voters. Well, how do you see the presidential race now? And what is your, your assessment of where things stand? Well, like I said, I believe Joe Biden is winning, and the Biden-Harris campaign, I think, has been very effective in finding ways, uh, even with the pandemic, to be out and about and campaigning, and at the same time, which is very different from the president, uh, do in a way that shows respect for the health and safety of voters and supporters. And that's going to continue, of course, to be the challenging uh, balance. Uh, right now, it is extraordinary to see that, uh, uh, you know, for a, an incumbent Republican president to be worried about defending Texas or North Carolina. Uh, it really shows you how things have shifted in this country in our favor, but uh, we're gonna have to work for every vote. Uh, and we've got to, uh, you know, we really have to be paying attention not only to the uh, sliver, uh, important sliver of Americans who even now are making up their mind about whether to vote, but also quite a few Americans who are, uh, are sorry, how to vote. Uh, there, I think there's actually a larger number of people thinking about whether to vote. And it's so important that everybody who cares about the future votes. And, uh, you know, so much has been given in order to make it possible for us to vote. Uh, and you add to that just the, the immediate consequences to the election going this way or the other. And, uh, you know, if, if, if folks are at home, and I'm thinking especially about younger people who are pretty frustrated, with good reason, with the entire system, to realize that your moment of maximum power as a citizen is actually the moment that you go in and vote. Uh, you send a tweet, that's great. You take to the streets, that's important. But uh, the, the one expression of your... Uh, uh, beliefs that uh, other people actually have to live with. The one moment where you have power over those in office instead of the other way around. That's when you're filling out that ballot. And uh, it's so important that everybody uh, uh, take that step. And it's so important that uh, we beat back any efforts either to discourage or, or even to interfere with people's ability to do it. Okay. Gay Tree from Edison, New Jersey asks, what are some of the books you've read recently or documentaries that you've seen that you would recommend? I know you're teaching and have lots of other things, but if you had a chance to read anything that you would maybe even apart from the, the new book that you're uh, producing, but any, anything you would recommend people to, uh, to look at at this time? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, obviously I've got a soft spot for uh, Chaston's book, My Husband. I, I have something to tell you, which is, uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, his story is different from mine and it's, it's really powerful. And I think a lot of people have seen themselves in that story since it came out. So uh, uh, forgive me that note of personal <laughs> uh, 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 bias, but, it, but it's a great book. Um, uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book uh, on caste, I think, stands as, as one of the most important, uh, uh, certainly uh, one of the most important books written uh, to come out this year, um, because it's such a, a, a powerful analysis of what's happening with uh, race in this country and, and how it's always uh, been a certain way. It also gives us, I think, a different lens to figure out what to do about it. And it's just masterfully written in a way that I think stands as an example. It's literary. Uh, 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 brilliant uh, piece of literature as, as well as an important piece of analysis. Um, if you want to have trouble sleeping, uh, Rick Hazen's got a book on uh, what's going on with our, um, I think it's called Election Meltdown, something like that. It's about those mechanics of our elections and uh, uh, everything from false allegations of voter fraud to real issues uh, with election interference. And it's a good read if you really want to feel on top of some of these uh, concerns and, and issues. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's so much good literature coming out. I wish there was more time to sit, to sit with it because, uh, uh, you know, this is a moment to be arming ourselves with knowledge. And, and, and that's part of why I'm, I'm so thrilled to be part of this uh, uh, university community today. Do you try to carve out some time, like in the morning, evening? How do you make it a practice to read this kind of uh, really excellent literature? 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of us are finding our life habits changing when, when uh, life was a little more normal. Uh, I, I was on airplanes a lot, and that made for good uh, chunks of time to spend reading. Uh, obviously, it's a little different now. So uh, uh, personally, I'm, I'm not much of a morning person. The only thing that can get me out of bed is uh, uh, a running buddy counting on me or uh, uh, some work requirement. So it's really later in the day uh, uh, that I find myself reading. But uh, um, uh, like I said, this is, this is a good time to be asking big questions as well as getting through the through the week. Well, final question, Mr. Mayor, it actually comes from Sarah from Carbondale and it's pretty simple. It says, how do you remain hopeful? Mm. I'll tell you one thing that, that really helps for me is seeing amazing people and what they do. Uh, so we're supporting uh, a number of candidates through my PAC, for example, we got an organization called Win the Era. Some of them, can't believe I'm old enough to say this, but some of them are these great younger candidates from a new generation, younger than me, who, who are running for office. And they're amazing. Some of them are really hot uh, races. Everybody's uh, probably paying attention to if you're uh, if you're closely following politics. Some are, are people I think not a lot of people have heard of. I hadn't heard of them until we started looking around the country uh, for great campaigns to get involved with. And so. That gives me a lot of hope. My students give me a lot of hope. They're these undergraduates. They are smart. They are, uh, I mean, the world has thrown a lot of, uh, at them to be coming of age in this moment with this economy and this pandemic. And that hasn't stopped them from, uh, uh, from really, I think, looking to the future. It gives me hope to think about what, if we get through this ugly moment, where we could be in our lifetime. I mean, the generations now living really could be the generations that deliver racial justice in this country. We could be the generation, matter of fact, we're gonna have to, uh, if we want the American project to survive. We could be the generations that, uh, uh, that uh, tackle the climate challenge. And again, there's, there's really no other choice. Uh, so while it's, it's frightening because we could be the generations that really watch the American project unravel. That story's not been written. Uh, matter of fact, the most important hinge point in that story hasn't yet come. It's this fall's election. And when I think about what the 2020s might be like, uh, this is why my podcast is called The Deciding Decade. I try to talk to people who can kind of get us thinking in a longer term picture. I think the 2020s could be an amazing period where technology and innovation and justice uh, flourish in this country and put us on a path toward being by the 2040s, uh, something the world has never seen, which is, uh, at full scale, uh, a fully prosperous, fully democratic, pluralistic society with no uh, racial majority. Uh, the, the possibilities for what that could mean to the world are on order with what it meant to the world when, uh, uh, when democracy was attempted here in the 18th century. And, and that gives me a lot of hope, even though I, it's uh, far from a certain future. And it, it gives me propulsion as well as hope because so much of that's up to us right now. Great. Well, Mr. Mayor, I know you have a packed schedule, so thank you for taking the time to talk to us. If you're heading, ever heading our way, I know Iowa is the, uh, we're between uh, you and Iowa, so if you're ever heading that way, we'd love to have you come to Southern Illinois and, and uh, meet with some people and students at SIU and, and talk about your vision for, for the future. Well, I'd love it and uh, look forward to the opportunity. In the meantime, uh, I hope everybody stays involved and engaged, and uh, uh, thanks so much for the chance to join you. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. Please watch a video of this uh, uh, tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And thank you for your continuing support of the Institute, which keeps the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.